All right, my friends. So here we go. Another episode and another special guest. And I'm not going to introduce this guy because those of you that are close to me here in Sullivan County and maybe the neighboring counties are probably going to recognize the voice before he even says his name. Right. So we're just going to kind of get into it. I'm going to let him introduce himself and then we're going to go from there. So welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> See, there we go. Tell us who you are and where you're from. All right. So, yeah, Nate Routledge, um, Roscoe Rockland Fire Department, down at the, not too far away from you guys, but towards the other end of the depart of the, uh, the county, a little further away from the city and the suburbs and that end of things. Um, yeah, like I say, Roscoe Rockland Fire Department, been around you guys here for a little while now. Um, still a new guy in the fire service. Uh, still a rookie, pretty much. I'd, I'd consider myself a rookie, rookie officer. Um, seven years in right now. Um, like I said, currently captain of the Roscoe Rockland Fire Department. All right. So those of you who are not close by that are listening from well, all over the world at this point in time um, aren't going to recognize Nate's voice. But those of you who are close by are going to recognize Nate's voice as a 911 dispatcher. Um, so let's let's dive into this a little bit. Um, let's talk about your road to you know how you became a volunteer uh, where it started, your background, uh, because I don't think it's, it's not the typical path, right? I mean, yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's, um, so let's get into it. Let's talk about how you became a volunteer. So I guess it goes all the way back, uh, to when I was a kid, I was one of those, you know, probably millions of them over the world grew up seeing fire trucks or fire engines as I knew them back home and, uh, wanted to be, wanted to be a fireman. So where's, um, where is back home? Back home, oh, yeah. So, so back home is uh, the very south coast of England. Uh, just a small town outside of Bournemouth, right down on the south coast on the beach. Um, so back home in England, everything is career. Everyone's mm -hmm. paid. There is no volunteer. Uh, the closest thing is what they call retained. You have a pager. You work a shift schedule. But you have to live within, I think it was three or four minutes of the fire station. Um, and I never did. I tried a whole pile of times as I got older. Um, never was able to make it work. Uh, applied to a bunch of career departments there, big places like London, and it's such a crazy process back home. Um, right, right. It's and, like a, it's ahead. like a twenty-page application. You write all this stuff down, and you're answering like essay questions. It's like a test at school, and right. you make one little spelling mistake, and it's and it's in the garbage, and they're on to the next guy. It's crazy. Wow, super competitive. Yeah. So. Uh, I pursued that for, for quite some time. As soon as I was old enough, uh, 17, it's like 17 and a half at home, you could start applying. Um, was unsuccessful. So then, you know, time went by. I ended up over here. I met my wife. Um, we did the whole back and forth thing. and We decided we were going to settle here. Um, and I'd learned a little bit about the volunteer service and that volunteer departments wanted guys like me to come in and sign up and, and help and become right. firemen. So um, at the time, the chief was... A, a very good friend of mine um, who actually graduated high school with my wife. Uh, Dusty was the chief. Mm -hmm. So before I'd even moved from England, I hadn't even packed my stuff yet. I hadn't booked a flight. I had the email fired off. I'm like, yo, I'm coming over. Like, I really want to come down and join. Um, what's the deal? Um, so I kind of had the wheels of motion before I'd even left. So what, what brought you here in the first place? What, what made you come to the U.S.? So I used to do BMX racing. And I was right. sponsored by a company from New York City. And I just, I came over one summer. I stayed with a buddy up in, up, up in Albany. Mm -hmm. um, his wife went to school with my wife. And so that's how that kind of linked. And then the, the long-term thing came up. But, uh, but yeah, that was actually BMX. Was, really? Wow, that's wild. Yeah. So yeah. Roscoe, all right, is a uh, small rural department, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. About how many active members would you say? It's dropped since I joined now. Um, now I would say close to 50. Okay. So 50. Yeah. Yeah, 50, 50 is a good number for, yeah. a, for a, rural, yeah. a rural department. Those of you who are listening that, that don't know where Roscoe is, um, jump on your favorite map program, Google Maps or whatever, and, and punch in Roscoe, New York, and, and you'll find that it is famous for things like fly fishing and now beer. 
Trout Town right. USA. Yeah. Right, Trout Town USA. Some very famous people have been to to Roscoe. Uh, I'm sure, there's some people listening that have stopped at the Roscoe Diner too, because we get that no matter where we go. Absolutely, absolutely. It's kind of yeah. it's kind of like when I tell people I'm from Monticello, they say, "Oh, the Concord Hotel, which hasn't been here in quite some time, but was a uh, landmark for many many years for the New York State Fire Chiefs Convention." So anybody that's a, a, a firefighter or you know, o- that's over uh, probably 20, eh, 25, 30 years old would remember the Concord. Okay. Um, because that's where the fire chiefs convention was. So you end up here, um, prior to even coming, you see the opportunity to become a volunteer firefighter, which is something that you wanted to do, uh, back home, but couldn't get the opportunity because it's all, because it's all career. Um, so you end up here, Um, you make the commitment before you're even really here full time and then you decide to join the department and where do we, where do we, where does it go from there? From there, man, um, I I pretty much jumped in with both feet. Like I came down, I loved it. I'd be here early on Mondays, uh, Monday nights, our drill night. Um, I took every class they would let me take. Um, I mean, you probably remember back to my firefighter one days, you're one of the guys that would, would come down and help, um, I think I was actually, so I was kind of a unique situation. Um, I was the first ever member of the fire department that was not a U.S. citizen. Um, okay. So I actually had to, we have our probationary vote. Once you're, you're done, you get voted in. But I had to go through an extra vote to even be a probationary member. Um, did that. And there was actually some stuff down with John at the training center there. I think I was the first guy to take a state class in Sullivan County that wasn't a citizen either. Oh, okay. All right. so I had to jump through a couple, well, not even jump through hoops, but, you know, navigate a couple of obstacles along the way. Sure. Um, and, and yeah, you know, started taking classes and getting involved. And honestly, I've said to my wife a bunch of times too, that I probably would have been super homesick for like that first year or whatever that I was here when we made the move, had I not had the fire department. Um, yeah, you know, yeah I, I was a member here within a couple of weeks and, you know, then suddenly I'm starting to get to know people in town and, and it just snowballed where you're now part of this big family and a big part of the community. And, and that was a big, big part of that. So I made things a lot easier. So, so one of the things that I've talked about in previous episodes, you and I have talked about before uh, on the side is, is, you know, morale around the firehouse and that feeling of, you know, that you're part of a, an extended family and being, being welcomed when you're a new member and not having too many stumbling blocks thrown in your way when you're motivated and ready to uh, dedicate time to your community and to your department. And um, you know, Roscoe is one of those departments that, that I as an outsider have always um, admired as well because I, because, and I know it from the outside looking in, obviously it's always a little bit different when you're entrenched in it, but from the outside looking in, it has always given the feel of, that kind of a welcoming family department. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, um, and you know, one of the things we've talked about in in previous episodes was how, when you don't have that, that, you know, is it uh, pushing away some of your potential volunteer pool? And you guys have always been good at grabbing people and kind of bringing them in right? And making them feel like home. So what, what are some, you know, what are some tricks to that that you see from, you know, somebody that didn't just come from, you know, you didn't grow up in the community. You, you, you weren't even in the country, you know, and, no. and you came here and, you know, there's departments that I'm sure you could have gone to and people would have been like, you know, who the hell is this guy? And why does he talk like that? You know, so, so guys here still say that <laughs> yeah yeah so so what are what are some things that you know that, that you think are important when you know somebody like yourself is new coming in that um that made your um you know transition to that firefighting family easier i think it's like you said you being welcoming um nobody wants to walk through the door and, and try to offer their time and you get that kind of that stink face across the room and you don't feel like you're welcome. The stank face. The stank face. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Nobody wants that. I mean, it's, yeah, making it feel like it's a family atmosphere. I mean, like anything, you know, it takes time to to get into that and and become accepted and and really be brought in. Um, You know, 
I mean, we get people to walk in and put applications in all the time and you tell them, all right, we'll see you next week. Come back. Feel free to come around and they don't come back. Right. So, right. You know, once you come around, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely trying to pull people into that, see them, you know, nurturing them. You know, what, what can they offer you? What can they give you? You know, and, yeah, and we, on that. when we talked about this a little bit in the recruitment and retention episode, and honestly, some of the feedback that I've gotten from that was um, regarding bringing pe- allowing people to come in and hang around and become a part of the family before they're even actually a member. Mm-hmm. And I, I was surprised at how much feedback I got from people that had, had never even thought of that concept. And right. it's something that we do in my department, it's something that you guys do in your department. But, you know, I think when they do come back, do you agree that it kind of like pulls them in and immediately makes them feel more welcome and like, hey, you know, ooh, this is where I belong. You know? Yeah. And we've had some guys too that it's really like hooked them in. Maybe they came around, they weren't sure. Um, and, you know, there's the limitations in the beginning with how much you can do. You've got to get your physicals. You've got to go through the background checks. But we always tell them, while that stuff's going on, come around. Like, feel free. Come here on a Monday night. We'll show you the ropes. You can stand around and watch what we do. And we've just done simple drills, like extrication drills. And we've had people, like, lose their mind. And it just drew them right in. They're just like, man, this is awesome. I really want to do this. Yeah. And just letting them be, be immersed in that is, is sometimes, you know, sometimes just let somebody jump on a fire truck and go into the fireman's field sometimes that's enough where you're just like all right yeah this is cool yeah well you gotta look you gotta set the hook right yep it's like fishing right if 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 the fish takes you know nibbles on the bait but you don't set the hook you're never going to bring the fish in right yep. so it's kind of it's it's the same thing with a with a potential volunteer you know if they come around and maybe they're not sure you know but they're kind of feeling things out but you but you, you set the hook by immediately inviting them right back or even we have people that walk in lots of times on a drill night because they know that's when there's people at the, at the station right. and that's yeah. when they can grab an application and we'll say, Hey, you know, hang around tonight, you know, get to know some people, you know, you can't put your hands on, you can't get involved, but you can watch, you can see what we're about. And that, that it's like setting the hook, you know, if they're, if they're yeah. really interested, they're going to keep on coming back. But, you know, on the flip side, if you hand them a paper application, you're like, all right, bro, thanks for stopping by. We'll see you on April, whatever, the first Thursday. We'll see you on April, whatever, you know. You know, what are the chances that in those, those two, three weeks that right. they're going to find something else to do? Yeah, or or just off, second, yeah. second, you know, or, or you know, second guess themselves. And, and That's about the only thing we stopped doing as a department was we try to, uh, we try not to have them come to a monthly meeting initially so if they come and the next week is a monthly meeting maybe we'll tell them like all right just skip next week we'll see you the monday after and come yeah, back and try yeah. to keep them out of that for a while right well and because anybody that's listening that's a volunteer knows that monthly meetings can go really really well or monthly meetings can go they can. can be pretty a pretty rough first impression on on people but they, yeah. but again it's it's you got to tell them right that and and i don't know if this comes up in in your guys investigating process when you're sitting with somebody one-on-one you know you, you gotta you gotta tell them that look we're, we're a family we're an extended family families don't get along all the time you know but the important part of it is when we don't get along so if you if you do happen to come to that first meeting and it's a doozy of a meeting you know you got to understand that it's just guys and girls sharing their opinions and that everybody here is allowed to have an opinion. And just because you disagree, right, doesn't mean you're on the outs when you walk away. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what you've said in the last couple of episodes. You, you disagree. You, you, you make your point. Shake hands. You go away. Whatever. And you, you get on with the job. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's how it should be. Extremely important. So, yeah. all right. So you come over. You, you, you're, you're motivated when you get here. You immediately join. Um, they put you through the probationary paces you, you educate yourself as much as you can and still do i might add um which i know you know you feel is extremely important and i feel is extremely important that that consistent education regardless of 
how often you train or how big or small your department yeah. is. Right? Or what color your helmet is, right? Or what color, right. There's or that what old color. saying, no matter the color of your helmet, we still train. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So you, put, you do your probationary time, you do some time as, as a black hat, and then you decide to step into the officer ranks. Where, where, where does that change happen, and, and how was that process for you? Yeah, so that was kind of... Uh, I think you and uh, Chief John kind of touched on that in one of the other episodes there about, you know, your elections and the way things go. Um, we're, we, we're appointed into line officer positions. Um, I was very fortunate. I get, I'm going to say fortunate because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to, to have the role I have. I'm proud to have gone through what I did. And, and I think it was great. Um, I was doing the right things at the right time. And it just happened to be that there was a couple spots opened up. Um, and the chief at the time, took a gamble on me. I, I only had two years in the fire department. So right. I was new. I was super new. And, um, and, there's, and there's some people that are going to be listening to that that are going to be going, holy shit, two years in the fire yeah. department and this guy is a lieutenant, right? Yeah. And, and this guy's a lieutenant. But again, there's a lot of you out there that also understand that um, it's not the easiest thing to do sometimes is fill the ranks of – Mm -hmm. the officer's positions in the volunteer fire service. So we've got, all right, so you're in for two years and you're appointed as, as a Lieutenant by the chief. Yeah. And and what actually kind of made, I say what kind of made it go a little easier for me is there was two spots open. So they moved two of us up and the other guy they moved up just happened to be one of my best friends. One of the guys I'm closest with in the fire department, Um, you know, we're always bouncing ideas off each other. We're taking classes. We're taking outreach classes. He wouldn't be a little guy, would he? He'd be a little guy with a big mustache. Yeah. Guy, yeah all, right, <laughs> all right. All right. And that, it's an inside joke for some of you listening, but he exactly knows that we're talking about him right now. Yeah, so he knows. that's all right. And I'll, I'll be getting a message, but anyway, he's a good, uh, little guy. He's, a, he's a good little guy with a big mustache. So. Solid brother. Solid brother. Absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Sorry. So yeah, we, we, we actually got promoted, well, moved up the same night. They appointed us the same night. Um, he was, you know, whatever, whatever the way they did it, he was one spot above me. So I'm kind of following his coattails through the ranks and he had a lot more time in and experience. He'd just been away doing a bunking program. Um, and that made it, A, it made it fun because there's two of us and we were buzzing, you know, we got this position. And we, we, uh, we're on the same wavelength, but we also kind of help each other out too, where like maybe he wants to go a different way on something and I'll pull him back and, and the same. Um, so yeah, we moved up through the ranks together that way. Um, what so challenges, where, what challenges do you think, um, you, you faced going from, you know, that rank and file firefighter to a Lieutenant two years later when let's face it, two years prior, you were just still thinking about becoming a firefighter, right? So yeah. now, now you're in a leadership position, um, leading guys, and kind of knowing the layout of your department, leading guys that have been there for 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Been a member for 50 years, past chiefs that have been around forever, right? And and here's a guy that two and a half years ago was on the other side of the pond, and now you're here and you're a lieutenant. So what what were some of the challenges that you think you faced as a new officer coming in? Well, there was the usual stuff where you had the, you had your, your one crowd there that maybe got a little salty that they didn't get the position, um, which is something that I think you guys will cover there down the road with your entitlement episode. You know, you got the guys that maybe they had five, six years on the job, on the job in the department, however you sure, want to work, yeah. um, that maybe weren't doing as much as they thought they were doing. Maybe they didn't deserve it as much as they thought they did for those people that say, I've been here way longer, I should be next. You had that crowd in the corner. They were being, you know, maybe they started to distance themselves a little bit. Um, And then you had, like you were saying, there we got a lot of guys here that got a lot of time in the department. And my biggest challenge for me was how am I going to take on the responsibilities of this role, do it, do, do the position justice, do a good job at it, while also trying to, you know, am I going to walk in with two and a half years on until a fifty-year member? Hey, I need you to do this. Or, Hey, let's do this. Um, that was tough. 
What do you think the What do you think the key to it was as as you got settled into the position and started you know started to feel a little bit more comfortable? What do you What do you think the key to earning those guys respect was? Those older members, I would say, I always try to listen to them. Okay. Sometimes, you know, we have one guy that is phenomenal with ropes. Mm-hmm. He was, uh, I think he was like a nice lineman back in the day. He, this guy is unreal with ropes. But we'll get out our, you've seen that, you know, the rescue bag with all the, the ropes and the pulleys and the beaners. And we'll start, start setting up Z-rigs in the back of the bay. And he'll be giving us the hardest time. You don't need that stuff. You need a block and tackle. You need this. <laughs> yeah. But rather than just telling like, yo, this is the way we do it now. Like, this is it we'll entertain him we'll let him come down and bring his piece of rope out and, and make a pulley and show us and humoring them you know listening to them um, sure. when they want to tell you that you're doing it wrong because this is how they did it 100 years ago listening to them taking their you know their point of view in and then maybe trying to educate them that hey this is the way they're moving now yeah um, you know without just shutting them off i think if you just shut people down like that you'll never get their respect well and i think i think the other thing that ties into it is and you mentioned it before the fact that you were consistently looking to better yourself right to consistently whether it was go out to the training center or go to a neighboring department or participate in drills at your own department right you're always looking for training you know different training that was available to you and training opportunities and there's not a lot of people that are going to watch somebody do all of that and then continue to judge them negatively. You know, most, most people, you know, or most firefighters, if they see, uh, you know, a young guy, they're going to judge the young guy that thinks he knows it all and doesn't do a goddamn thing when it comes to training. But when they see somebody like yourself and, and some of the guys around you, that are constantly going out and looking for those training opportunities and trying to bring other people along with them for the ride with you for the ride, they're going to be like, Oh, all right. You know, this guy's trying. You know, he might be a little wet behind the ears and it might not be hands on experience, but, but he's out there, he's trying to learn, he's, he's, you know, doing his best to continuously educate himself. And that, that's huge. Cause you got to ask their advice too, you know, and and take some guidance from them guys. Don't, don't be afraid to reach out to the guy that maybe was chief 10 years ago, but Hey, how would you handle this? How do you do this? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you you know, it's definitely, you, you know, if, if we want respect, we got to give respect. And, you know, I mean, there's generation, generationally there, there's, there's lots of differences. Um, You know, sometimes guys that were chief, maybe 15, 20 years ago that didn't continue with the education portion of it, you know, are a little salty when they look at today's rules and regulations and they're like, well, what do you mean? I can't come back as chief. Or what do you mean I can come back as chief, but I can only stay a year because I got to meet all these training requirements, you know? Yeah. But, you know, when you sit down and you have a real honest conversation with it, with people about it, and, and you're like, it's just not the same as it was yeah. 15 years. It's not the same as it was five years ago. You know, things advance so much and so, yeah. so fast and so quickly. That's so cool. you've moved up again since then, right? So now you're the captain. Move so up the captain this year. Yeah. So, so you're so you now you're you're sitting in the captain's seat and you you've got some officers and uh, firefighters below you. How are you finding that position? Still kind of getting into it. It's only been a couple months now, and yeah. um, we haven't had the busiest start to the year. But again, it's something that I'm looking to the guys that did it before me and taking advice from them and. Um, yeah, it's it's fun so far. I got a there's a great group of guys in the line. So even the the you know the three lieutenants we have right now, they're they're a great bunch of guys. Um, and we also have Dusty in there in that spot below me, who was you know my chief when I joined, and so I, I look to him a lot for advice and, and guidance. Um, it's fun though. I love it. Th- this was the one position like coming up through the lieutenant ranks. I was like, man, I I, I kind of was probably more pumped to get the captain than than to get the chief. But there's only yeah, well the cap the, the captain's a nice spot. You know, you you've 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 got that leadership role as, as the, the senior company officer, you know, but you're not quite taking on that chief's responsibility yet yeah. where, you know, where you know that your, your time, you know, especially if you're an interior guy, right? And I know you're an interior guy. So, it, you know, you get that 
when you jump to the white hat and you know, all right, my inside time is going to be limited for the next God knows how many years, depending yeah. on, you know, what your, what your, how your positions play out, but it's definitely a, it's definitely a fun, a fun spot to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's been good so far. So now, and so how many years, how many years have you been uh, a volunteer now? This will be, this is my seventh year. All right. So you're seven, you're seven years in, um, when you were, when you were on the other side of the pond there, you had aspirations, um, to become career because that was your only, your only, uh, possibility to be a firefighter was be career. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, um, been a 911 dispatcher for a few years. Uh, how many years have you been doing that? I think that's four years now. Four years. All right. So you, yeah. you've been a 911 dispatcher for four years and that's, that's a job um, that that is seldom not talked about. That obviously is an extremely extremely important point in the chain, right? If we don't have the people to take those calls and get those calls out and professionally give us the information that we need to know, and you know, obviously the whole system could potentially fall apart. Yeah. Um, so, but now you've got, you've got some other aspirations. You, you're still looking to go that, that career route. Yeah, so definitely. Tell I'm me how that. Ex- I'm still exploring it, you know. I'm signing up for tests all the time, taking tests. I'm on a couple of lists here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's always going to be my end goal. Um, hopefully, I manage to, to make it happen somehow, some way. Um, but, you know, the, the volunteer side is definitely fueling that fire even more. I mean, if you could pay me to come and do what I do here, I mean, <laughs> my wife is always yelling at me because there's stuff to get done around the house. The grass has got to get mowed, but she come, you know, I get snitched on all the time because she works at the bank in town. Hey, Nate Strzok's been outside the firehouse all day. You got no <laughs> jobs for him to do it. A honey-do list must be kind of small. And she comes home and there's mold in that needs putting up and stuff like that. So, yeah, well, you know, yeah, as a career would be great. Most of us have somebody in our in our corner that that kind of knows the deal, right? Knows yeah. where knows where our passions lie, and knows that this is an important part of of what we do. Um, look, I was I was fortunate because uh, my my wife was she already knew it because her dad was a was a past chief in a neighboring department and is a over 50 year member. So I always, I always kid around when people say, you know, how the hell can you spend so much time dedicated to the fire service, whether it be the volunteer firehouse or training or going here or going there. I'm like, well, she kind of knew what the deal was getting into it because she already lived it. So, yeah. uh, so that, <laughs> that definitely, that definitely works out. You definitely couldn't do it without them. That's, that's for sure. No, I say no, that all def- the time, you know, I'm, no, definitely, I'm not. definitely not. But, um, so how do you see, um, I mean, I know, I know where you're trying to, to get on the job and, and, I'm, and I'm assuming your goal is to get on the job somewhere where you continue, can continue to volunteer where you're at. And, and again, you know, those of you who are listening have absolutely no freaking clue where the hell we are or where we're located. You know, I, like I said, punch in Roscoe and I can tell you there aren't a tremendous amount of career opportunities encompassing uh, the Roscoe area that you could commute to and, and still consider that your hometown and, and, uh, and continue to volunteer there. So yeah, New York in general, it's crazy. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. New York in general. So what, how, how are you, did, did that play into your, when you're out taking your test, does that play into your thought process at all? Um, maybe a little bit. Okay. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would, you know, this is the place that gave me the opportunity to do what I'm doing and to pursue those, those avenues, um, kind of taught me my trade, if you like. So Absolutely. I'd, you know, I'd love to be able where I could come, you know, come home and volunteer or, you know, days off and stuff like that. So definitely in the back of my mind, always, you know, um, families here, friends are here, all that kind of stuff. So it definitely all plays, right. plays right. a part. Right. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's crazy. You know, when I, when I look at it, I mean, we have, I've always been fortunate enough to kind of see it from a little bit of a different side, be involved in the training end of it. Um, but somebody asked me this question a couple of weeks ago, I think we were starting a new probie class and we we're talking about, you know, where you can go with this opportunity that everybody is starting as a volunteer. And he throws the question at me totally 
catches me off guard and says, how many guys have you had come through your classes that are now on the career side? And I'm like, whoa, you know, I trying to quickly formulate it in my head. There's quite a few, you know, yeah. and there's, there, there's quite a few that, that, you know, that I know personally that are all over the country at this point, uh, which is cool to think about um, that all got their start um, in the volunteers. Yeah. They all got their start in the volunteers and, 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 thinking about just about every one of those guys and girls they all before we even kind of coined it this professional volunteer uh, phrase they looking back at them they were all that was their mindset you know yeah. I want to be the best that I can be at this job Man, I don't care if I'm not getting paid for it yeah, yeah. Because, I think that's if that's what you're aspiring to be and 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 now, especially even more with social media and stuff like that, you go on Instagram, you're, you're watching these videos of these paid departments and you, know, you watch how they lay into jobs or you watch how they do stuff. It makes you want to aspire to be like that, be like them guys. And, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Back in your mind somewhere that you want to do this as a career, maybe that does help you. Yeah, absolutely. More professional approach. Yeah, and, and, and listen, you know, I know there's, there's lots of stuff. We talk about all the stuff that you can see out there on social media and some of it's great. Some of it's not so good, but it's not, it really doesn't matter. You know, the, the good content, the good training videos, the, 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 uh, the, the stuff that you can really turn to, to help you learn. It, it doesn't matter what side of the fence it's on. You know, there's plenty of, there's plenty of great content being put out there by volunteers and there's tons of great content being put out there by professional career guys, you know, and then there's, shitty content on both sides as well you know there's we know there's plenty of really poor volunteer content out there yeah you might have to dig a little bit more to find the poor on the career side but generally that's because there are departments over the top looking at them not allowing them to put it out there you know yeah and volunteers just don't seem to have that oversight which i wish they would yeah, and that's why i like you know this this whole professional volunteer the whole message of it that's that's why i like that you know it's we should aspire to be like those paid departments, whether you run you know, 5,000 calls a year or small department, you know, we run just over a hundred calls a year on a good year. You should still aspire to be like one of those big departments. And Absolutely. So that's one of the, one of the other things I wanted to, to ask you as we're, as we're winding down here is being a smaller department, a smaller rural department that doesn't run a tremendous amount of calls. What's, what's a busy year for you guys? Uh, so the busiest one I can remember here the last couple of years was like 114, 115. Okay. So hundred, so 115 calls a year. And there are, there are departments in our County that are even more rural with even less calls. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But running only 114 calls a year. What do you, how, what do you think? Um, how do you keep your guys and girls engaged? Right. Because one of the things that we've talked about in the past is, you know, when you're training, you're training, you're training, you're training. And you're always training, but you're never, ever putting to use the stuff yeah. you're, you're, that you're training on. Right. Yeah. I, it, it, and we're not a tremendous amount. You know, we're not that much busier than you guys. You know, we're maybe 100 calls more, which isn't busy by any stretch of the imagination. But but, you know, if you're running 100 calls a year or less. That's not a lot, right? No. So how do you keep your people engaged for, so that they know that, you know, you know, we're doing all this for a reason. Yeah, one day you're going to need to use it. And when you do need to use it, you got to be ready. You got to be ready. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. One, one I'd love some suggestions on <laughs> and some pointers. <laughs> but uh, we, we try to keep the training. Yeah, I'd say we try to keep it kind of fun. Um, you know, we, we try to change stuff up. Like I say, we've got a, a great group of guys coming through. So our the way our officers work is each lieutenant and also now myself, um, we all take a drill a month. Okay. So somebody new teaches a drill, somebody new has a different idea. Maybe they're going to do like a small bit that builds to a bigger drill down the road. Um, we try to keep it, you know, fun, but also stuff that we do, you know, just try to keep it, uh, trying to think of the word now too, but I just had a brain fart, but you know, uh, Try to keep it relevant. Yeah, sure. absolutely. You know? yeah. There's a lot of like your mundane, you know, research stuff that we do every year. Um, 
but yeah, just that you've got to do it. It's difficult if you you know you go a whole month for no fire calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, it's and rough. and you know a great something I and I never really thought about it this way. And when I had um, John on, one of the things that he said in episode three, I think it was, was you know we get into this kind of rut of drill has to be on whatever day of the week it is from seven to nine or seven to ten and we've got to stay on that regimented schedule you know and he and and he said you know what i don't need i don't i don't need three hours i don't need to give me an hour of your time no. and I'll, I'll make you think i'll make you learn i'll make you use your head you know i'll i'll you know i'll, I'll put you through the paces because you know if we don't have three hours worth of content, why do we need to keep them out of their house, away from right. their family, whatever, for, for, for three hours? And that was a good point that I, you guys made in that episode that really hit home with something that we're trying to do more now is capitalizing on these people's time. Like, and if you do only have them there for an hour, make sure you, that, you know, as officers, you're there early. You've got your stuff set up. You've got a game plan in your head and you're knocking it out. So these guys aren't wasting their time on a Monday night. Absolutely. And, and, and we need to, and we need to make them realize that, you know, what's the end game, you know, why, why are we doing all this stuff? Cause eventually the alarm is going to ring and eventually you're going to get put to task. And Absolutely. when you do get put to task, it, it's, it's actually more dangerous for a volunteer that only gets to use those skills a couple of times a year versus a guy that's, you know, riding on an engine in a career house that might be using it multiple times a week or even multiple times a day, or in some cases, multiple times within a couple of hours, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I, I, I go to different things and I, I listen to different people speak and it kind of ties into this a little bit. So this morning, this morning, the pastor at our church is talking about uh, he, he's using firefighters as a reference um, and training. You know, the fact that, you know, a firefighter trains and trains and trains and trains and trains. And, and what are they training for? You know, they're training for that end game for when they actually have to get put to task. And all that training is makes them feel like, you know, when it's time to put the tool, when it's time to put uh, those tools to work, so they have that feeling of, you know, that they were made for this, you know, I was right. made for this job. Now's my opportunity that I, you know, I'm made for this. I'm made for this job. And, um, and that can be, that can definitely be tough to do, but I think, you know, you're on the right track when you say, you know, we got to keep it relevant. We got to keep it fun. We got to, you know, make sure that they don't feel like we're wasting their time. Um, and, and appreciate the people that we have. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you've got to find, find their, their strong points and, you know, maybe they, they're not strong in every area and you try to you know, learn what, what they're good at and what they're maybe not so good at. Try to nurture them here and there and you capitalize on the skills that they are good at, you know. It's Absolutely. A big thing too, you know. Um, so I read a thing too that said to get these guys engaged and, you know, like your older members maybe, have them host a drill once a month or have them host a drill once every quarter and, you know, that I, we've done that too and you just see that gets get some of these guys fired up too even if it's just a real simple thing and you hey you got you want to do a drill for me this month and they come up with something that that normally goes pretty well too yeah yeah absolutely so so two 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 more things i'll bring up so um if i ever show the the, the video portion and i'm capturing video on all of these that maybe we'll use one day down the road but so so nate's the guy that i frequently um bust his balls a little bit because he's the guy that can like grow the beard in like a day and a half. Right. So I'll, I'll see him on social media and I'll be like, yo bro, you know, you, you're looking like you got to hit the razor today. You know? I'm like on those little emojis with the guy with a little beard. <laughs> so yeah, it's usually a little emoji, but, but um, you know, we've talked about that on, on previous episodes, you know, the rules and, and, you know, making sure that we're setting, setting the right example. And, um, you know, we try and we keep it fun, fun amongst us as, as, as friends. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, one other thing that I know that you and I have spoken about over the last couple of years is fitness in the volunteer fire service. Right. And yeah. not, not just because you've got those career aspirations now and you have to do it. Right. But 
talk to me for a minute about, you know, your thoughts over the last couple of years on yourself personally and your fitness goals as resolve, you know, how it relates to being a volunteer fireman. So I'm probably your typical yo-yo exerciser. You know, I get into it for a while. Maybe there's a few months that I'm, I'm hitting it hard. Um, and then I drop right off again. Uh, we're, we're super fortunate here that we have a, a great gym set up right at the firehouse. And we have a community center that's also across from the firehouse. Um, and we have a great setup down there at the department to take care of us. And I got to interject here real quick, only because I, I learned this firsthand the other night, is that your gym, um, and I don't know how many, maybe this is just a one and done kind of a deal, but your gym being the only gym in town brought you a new member recently who pretty much joined because he wanted to use the gym, right? Yeah. So part, yeah. recruitment and retention tool, right? Is, yeah. is something you might not typically think of, right? But when you come from a small community that you got to drive 30 minutes to get to the closest gym, right? Yeah. It so, helps. Okay. I had, to interject, I had to interject that. So go, go ahead. Keep on. Yeah. Going. So yeah, that's, you know, it has grabbed us a couple of members, you know, not even just the fire department side. We have our ladies auxiliary side and I know that they generated a much younger base of members now too. Um, and some of those ladies, you know, we're looking to access the gym. So they come and they help out with all our events and, and stuff like that. So it helps. Um, we're actually looking, uh, so the guy that you're talking about is looking at putting together uh, some kind of like a CrossFit workout, fire department type CrossFit thing for the members. And um, Very cool. You know, we've pushed it and, and sometimes come the summertime, there'll be a pile of us down there and I'm sure I'll get back in the swing of things here in the next few weeks. Um, it is massively important. It's something that's overlooked a lot and I'm guilty of it, you know, um, complaining that you don't make, you know, you've got no time and stuff like that, which I know you're, you're called bullshit on that one, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's important, you know, you've got to do it. Yeah. You've got to try that. The numbers don't lie. You know, we're killing too many firemen every year just from cardiac arrest stuff. So yep. trying to, yep. you know, impose that is, is a big thing. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the time, the time excuses I like to call it, it's, it's, it's not unique. I mean, lots of people use it, right? Yeah. It is what it is. It's like anything else. You just got to kind of set your mind right and make, make the time. I'll tell you what, not so much anymore because I've, I've tried to stay somewhat consistent over the last five or six years. But when I was younger, I always tell people that I was just mom and dad blessed me with a really good metabolism. You know, I was always like the frame that I am now is the frame that I was when I was in my twenties and my teens. And, uh, you know, I would realize when I was in pretty piss poor shape, when I would don my PPE and my SCBA and I'd be crawling down a hallway and couldn't freaking breathe, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, you gotta, you gotta do something here. Do something, you know, right? because, yeah. you know you're, you're, you're sucking down a bottle and when you go outside, these guys are going to make fun of you. <laughs> you know, because you're 25 years old and there's no way in hell you used to be out of, out yeah. of your, uh, through your SCBA that you're fast. You're partner on the shoulder. You're like, oh, we got to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. So. Yeah. No, it is huge. And like I say, we're, we're very lucky here that we have that opportunity to be able to get in and work out and, and try to do stuff outside in the summertime too with guys and maybe something a little more job specific, but. Yeah, it's definitely huge. Even like the Spartan races like we do, you know, the, the OCR races and, and stuff like that. That's awesome for morale too. You get three, four, five guys together. Maybe you get a bunch of t-shirts made up and you, you, you run it in a fire department t-shirt. You represent. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You know, awesome and, and I have people tell me all the time, I actually had a few this morning tell me, oh, you know, I don't know how you do that. That shit's crazy. You know, I don't know why you get into, yeah, it's, you know what? First of all, it's not going to kill you. Well, un unless you're really out of shape, it might kill you. Uh, but, but it's, you know, like you said, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of team, you know, team building. Yeah. And, you know, you get in anything like that where you get a, a group of like-minded people and you're, you know, you're, you're out there kind of motivating each other to be a little bit better. Huge, you know, huge, yeah. huge part of what we do. And, you know, it kind of relates back to the, to the fire service, you know, the brotherhood, the sisterhood. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it's, that's what it's all about. Definitely. So I appreciate this, man. This was cool. This was definitely a, this was definitely a good, uh, a good episode. I think everybody's going to uh, definitely enjoy 
hearing uh, your your story and and uh, how it how it relates to everything that we're that we're talking about. And um, somebody wants to uh, follow you on your journey. Can they can they find you out there on the social sphere anywhere? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Nate Routledge on uh, Facebook, Routledge Twenty Nine on Instagram. You'll probably find me tagged in a couple posts there on the on the professional volunteer page and uh yeah thanks for having me on though i appreciate it it's uh it's cool to get to come on you know listening to the guests you had come on before me you know and like i say i'm i still consider myself a rookie so to come on and follow somebody like chief john that was on the the episode before is is awesome you know so i appreciate it yeah no i appreciate it and 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 for, and for those of you that don't don't know uh just because we we're kind of behind the scenes but you know nate's the guy behind the scenes helping me with some of the facebook posts and uh he's been pretty instrumental in selling quite a few of those professional volunteer command gene stickers and and uh like i said on instagram yesterday uh i think tomorrow i'm going to be you know cutting a check to send out to next rung and while i wish it was a huge huge check we're small but we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get a little bit bigger we'll, every time we'll get that we're going to send those we're going to send those guys a donation uh for all the good work that they do and nate helped me uh help me out with that and i i actually i you know i truly appreciate that and uh he's become a good friend over the years and um this has been uh, this has been a lot of fun, and if you go if you go follow his Instagram page, every once in a while you'll be blessed with some old school BMX, which yep. is uh, <laughs> pretty pretty cool to pretty cool to watch and see. You know, you like I like seeing people's flashbacks. So, Nate, I appreciate it, brother. And Steve, thank uh, you. Thank you once again for being on. All right, thank you. All right, you're welcome. <laughs>